that. Um, so I'm just going to welcome everybody who's joined us this evening. Um, uh, we're disappointed we're on Zoom, but not so disappointed because we've been able to uh, reach a lot more people today, um, including the filmmakers Beth and George Gage um, in a nice group setting. Um, Films on Purpose is pleased, extremely pleased to be partnering with Neighbours Link again and also with a new partner, Ossing for Refugees, and um, a film called Nebraska, I hope you all had a chance to watch it, um, is a great uh, preparation for talking about refugee settlement in our area. Um, we are recording, so if that's uncomfortable for you, um, uh, you maybe you should leave. Uh, I suggest that you all put your screens in speaker view because that way you'll see the uh, people who've been spotlit for the panel discussions. And um, I would also like to thank Westchester Community Foundation for a grant we received to help us do this. Um, we have a few people from Films on Purpose on uh, online with us and also from the other two organizations. And I'm going to introduce Ted Berger, who is the co-founder of Ossining for Refugees, and he's um, the lead coordinator for uh, the organization. And he is going to be the moderator on both panels. The format will be uh, a panel with the filmmakers, Beth and George Gage, and Andrea Garbarini, who's one of our Films on Purpose co-founders. And then we will just take a moment to switch to um, a panel with other people who are uh, local and have more information about local resettlement. So without further ado, uh, here's Ted. Thank you very much, Helen. I just want to thank uh, Films on Purpose for uh, all your work and effort on this event and the wonderful films and the, the wonderful things you've done to present films over the years. I think over 18 films that uh, really have a uh, have an impact and it's, it's it's an important work that you're doing. So I want to welcome George and Beth Gage, uh, the, uh, the leaders of Gage and Gage Productions um, and just marvelous uh, filmmakers, particularly in the area of environmental and social justice. Uh, and also introduce everyone to, who doesn't know her, to Andrea Gabarini, who is one of the co-founders of Films on Purpose and a filmmaker in her own right. Uh, nice to see you all. Um, so George and Beth, if I could, I want to set the stage actually by letting people know a little bit about you before we talk about the film. So it's my understanding that you were in the advertising business uh, and um, quite successful in that area and made a shift, George, and uh, with Beth at your right hand uh, into doing something you thought was more important. So can you just tell us about that? Well, yeah, I mean, I think you just said it. I mean, I was doing a television. I started out at Young and Rubicum in New York and as I was an art director and then I became a vice president of a smaller agency. But then I started directing television commercials and I realized after a while, I just didn't find it very fulfilling because uh, you really weren't dealing with issues at all. You were basically selling a product. And although I tried to be as creative as possible, there are limitations, both in the fact that when I was doing it, most of them were one minute long, which is pretty short. Now they're 30 seconds or even shorter. And the fact that you can only do so much creativity, use so much creativity in commercials, although some commercials are wonderful. So I decided with Beth uh, pushing me, and, and Beth is uh, a wonderful writer, that we would work together on uh, social justice uh, documentaries. Yeah, and actually it happened when we moved. We lived in California, then we moved to Telluride, Colorado, and uh, we weren't going to do television commercials anymore. And we realized that this was a perfect opportunity to start to do what, what we thought was more meaningful, and that was you know, films with a bit of a conscience. No, quite wonderful. Thank you. So, um, Beth, uh, my understanding is that uh, um, you pick the subjects. I'm sure it's a collaborative process of picking the subjects, but do you in particular pick the subjects and write the narration and do that side? And George does absolutely beautiful cinematography. Um, so tell us with this film, what drew you to this topic? 
Well, um, I think it was about 2016 and uh, there was a particularly large amount of refugees, uh, especially from Syria at that time. And we were, I, I imagine all hearing about uh, refugees uh, coming across from Asia into you know, uh, Greece and Turkey and places like that. And I wondered what was happening here in the United States. What was our uh, situation with refugees, with welcome, welcoming them or what? And uh, started to do some research and found out that in fact, that particular year, Nebraska had welcomed more refugees than any other state in the United States, which was pretty surprising to, to me and to us. And uh, then, you know, I did some more research and found um, Lacey Studnicka, that if you've seen the film, you know who she is, and uh, started talking to her online and phone, and, and she invited us out to, to uh, Omaha, and that's how we started um, doing, the, doing the film, meeting all the wonderful people that uh, Lutheran Family Services had resettled and also different, different groups that had resettled refugees from all over the world. And our first trip to Omaha was a day after the 2016 election. And we were <laughs> oh celebrating and we'd be having, you know, music on the whole way and singing and so forth. And of course, we're in kind of a depressed mood going out to <laughs> Omaha. But, you know, everyone sort of felt like, hey, you know, let's give this guy a chance. Let's see what happens. Yeah. And they were still very hopeful that things would be fine. Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear they gave you a good Nebraska welcome anyway. Yes. So yes. That, that's yes. Nebraska nice. Very friendly. Nebraska very, nice. Very, very friendly. That's correct. So, George, the film begins um, with uh, um, a gripping scene with birds flying and uh, a male, who is a Yesidi, I believe, yes. Uh, yes. reciting a poem that she wrote. Um, and it just sort of grabs you right at the beginning of the movie. And I don't know exactly why, but you're the cinematographer. So, you know, what did you, why did you pick that? And, and tell us why it's so effective. Well, I found out about the sand cranes and it just seemed like an exciting thing to film. And the first time I filmed it, I filmed it alone and I filmed it early in the morning. And what happens early in the morning is they land. And that wasn't really to me as visually exciting. And then I found out that, oh, actually it's in the afternoon, right? I filmed them in the afternoon when they land, but in the morning they take off. And uh, Andrea was with me and we slept out across a field at dark. You can't make any noise. You can't have any flashlights or anything. And it's kind of an interesting story because I was carrying a 400 millimeter lens and they warned us about gopher holes and you had no chance of having a flashlight or anything. And sure enough, I tripped in a gopher hole. I went down, the, the lens was covered in mud, the camera was covered mm -hmm. in mud, I was covered in mud, I sort of hurt my ribs. And when the time that we got to the duck blind, it was where you film because again, the birds get very, very spooked very easily. I was hoping that Andrea, at least, you know, her camera would work and it did. And then I turned, and then after I cleaned mine with my sweater and everything else I could get my hands on, it, it worked as well. So we had good two camera coverage on that. And of course we shot it as soon as the light was light enough that we could pump up the ISO and shoot it in that low light. And I'm so glad that you are uh, referring to this scene because I love the fact that we shot it in the dark in the beginning and you don't know what it is. You just hear those bird sounds. I was hoping that would bring the audience in and I think that uh, it brought you in and I'm so glad of that. And with the two cameras, we had the wide shot and the close ups and it made a nice scene. I, I just wanted to add that we loved that footage, but we didn't actually know exactly what to do with it. And then Amal, when we met her and, and she recited her poem, and that was so poetic. And, and we have to give our editor credit, he put the two together. And, and that's great, you know, because we weren't sure exactly how to use either of them and and he put them together and and i think it really you know works. we always call film a collaborator a collaborative right. effort and that really shows it where you know beth and i and the editor 
and Andrea, it all worked together and, uh, you know, we were all elements in the soup, so ingredients in the soup. Well, I'm glad Andrea was there to capture some of the footage for yeah. you too. So yeah. that's, uh, that's great. Um, well, also as she goes through the poem, uh, there's a line in the poem, I run to the mountains with my tears and my pain. And the, the poem itself is a painful moment mm -hmm. as she goes through it and her face has pain in it as well. Um, yet the movie is not a painful movie. There are moments of pain in it, but it, I would characterize it maybe as different from many of your films in that it's, it's almost a happy movie. Hmm. Can you talk about that and example, yeah. the choices you made? Yeah, I, I think we always try to make films that, if, uh, that have you know, a positive message and the people that are welcoming refugees in Nebraska, as obviously you are doing in, in Ossining and other areas of New York State, um, are fabulous people. They're wonderful people and they are opening their arms and their homes to these people who are running for their lives. So it's, um, it is a, a kind of a happy film. The, the, the unhappy part of it is that there are people left behind, obviously. And, you know, I think we probably all are aware now that, that that's the situation, certainly in Afghanistan. And we have, you know, some people from Afghanistan in our film, and that's what they're worried about, their families that haven't been able to get out yet. But, you know, um, someone was mentioning before how in, in these families, Perhaps the husband may speak English, may have more education, but when these families come to the United States, the women get their driver's license, the women learn English, and the children are doing all of that immediately. So, you know, you see the real blossoming effect and, you know. When I thanked a woman, Kayla, who's in the movie, and I said, I think it's just wonderful what you do and how you help the refugees and how you help them get settled and fill the refrigerator with food and pay the first six months rent and everything else. She said, well, George, they bring so much to us. Our children learn from them. They learn another language. They learn other customs. They learn how people live in another part of the world. She said, so they bring an awful lot of good and an awful lot of knowledge and an awful lot of history with them. And in Nebraska, we don't get out that often. We're sort of an insulated state. And to have that kind of input is wonderful. That, that's really great. I want to uh, stop for one second and make sure that anyone who has questions knows that we will be taking questions later. And we welcome questions even as you go along. Submit them to the questions box. There's a person named questions uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the chat. And uh, Katie will organize those for me and we'll, we'll bring them to the surface. I ought to just be careful about my use of the word happy. Probably warm would have been a better word for that because there is an underlying um, pathos and sadness in all of this. And many examples of people who are both in pain and imposed, uh, have pain imposed on them. One of the most moving moments in the movie, to the film to me is when John speaks about his hatred. Could you talk about your choice for that and, and what that meant in the movie? Well, um, Lacey introduced us to John and told us that he had, you know, turned over a new leaf, I guess you would call it. Um, he lived in an apartment building that um, was, you know, home to some drug addicts, people like that. And as they moved out, the, um, the local the local uh, government and uh, different agencies were, were moving in uh, refugees and he was furious you know he hated seeing these you know women in hijabs and you know children that spoke a different language and all of that but gradually it, you know as you can see from the film um, he came around they started you know waving to him and thanking him for things and asking him if uh, he could help them fix their bicycle or things like that. And he realized that, you know, there was no, no real difference. These were families and they weren't drug addicts and, and they were, you know, responsible individuals. And uh, I mean, I think the, the, at, by the end of the film, um, John was upset with us that we hadn't included his 
his, um, I guess they were, I think Syrian uh, yeah, neighbors were, right. more than we had. So that's all he was upset about was that, that we hadn't, uh, you know, included them more, but we tried to explain the length of the film, but, um, but you know, it was just so nice to see someone change their mind. A lot of people don't realize the amount of footage, a lot of time you really have to spend making a film interviewing people, getting the thing, filming the things they talk about and so forth. So when they allow you to film them yeah. four or five times, a lot of times they get the feeling the film is about them when it really isn't, you know? Great. So um, Andrew, I want to just turn to you for a second um, and, and ask you, you were out there, you were watching the work, you were meeting the people. Were there a particular uh, person or story in this that particularly moved you and and you appreciated? Well, there was certainly a, a lot of them, but I, I think I really was moved quite often by um, uh, Fred. His real name is um, Fredun. Fredun. And um, he was an interpreter to, for the um, U.S. military. And um, <clears throat> there are many, many interpreters and people that have worked with our our, our military that um, in Syria, you know, in, in all these countries. And we don't always do the right thing in this country to get them here as quickly as we can because they're at risk when they're in their country. And um, risk. Yeah. yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, and and he, um, he got here. And if you see the clip, you know, he was shot at, he was almost killed his his family was almost killed but he finally got here and the and the welcoming that he he received from the from the other people the the Americans that were in you know in the military with him was very warm okay. and there was a, just a shout out to the one man Dave an older man in the movie who um worked for the FBI is that correct Beth correct. yeah and he was very instrumental in bringing Fred here with his family. And he was a very passionate man. And unfortunately we lost him to COVID, yeah. which is unfortunate. Yeah. But I, I got to know them um, quite a bit and I really was moved by their stories too. There's a, there's a lot of, yeah, of yeah. stories. So I understand, uh, Andrea, that um, I don't know whether it was John or, or Dave or who it was, but someone at one point was surprised that you as a, a person who had suffered personally in 9-11 could welcome the refugees. Could you just talk about that conversation? Well, Dave, Dave had said that to me that he just, he goes, I can't believe you do, you're here. I mean, it's, it's about compassion for our fellow human beings and it's about taking care of each other. You know, I don't look at those people with a broad stroke of they're all terrorists. And that's an unfortunate thing that happens a lot. I mean, these are human beings struggling to just have a decent life. Right. Yeah. So I was also very moved, uh, George and Beth, by, um, you know, you, you see the racism that exists in some of the comments that, uh, that people have, been, and, you know, these very compelling people have to endure this, and yet they say they love America. Um, and it's uh, sort of, again, it's, it's that beautiful, the pain and yet the warmth of uh, and the movie and one of the things I think is great about uh, uh, people who come from other countries, refugees, immigrants, is they often bring that sort of spirit America of America that we often have forgotten. Yeah, true. Um, yeah very true. So um, I would like to ask you one last question, and that is a lot of people, you know, loved this film, but they want to know what's next. What are you working on now? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're trying to do a very, we're trying to do a very small film. What happened is we were about to do a fairly large film on homeless college students. We found out that as much as 40% of the community college students in Los Angeles are living in their cars or churches or wherever they can. But when COVID hit, we just abandoned that project because it just became kind of scary medically. Yeah. And so right now we're following three young entrepreneurs that are building a bakery and they deliver bread on bicycles and they care more. They're like people from the 70s where they care more about community and more about the love of baking than they do making money. 
And uh, we found that kind of interesting and uh, we've been following them and it'll be a short film, a 15 minute film. That's great, that's great. Well, I wanna thank you for your, your great work. Uh, I'm being given the hook by my, my masters here uh, to go on to the next uh, panel, but uh, just marvelous work. Thank you for what you've done. And thank you, Andrea, too. It's just, uh, thank you. Uh, it was great to watch the film a couple of times, actually. Uh, and uh, I thought you knew it pretty well. Thank you for the work you're doing. Obviously. Yes, ab yeah. absolutely. All of you, thank you. All right, but, so we'll, we'll mute, we'll mute ourselves, okay. Helen, over to you to reshape our, our, our panel here. Okay, I'm going and, to do that. And, and while Helen is doing that, I will just uh, um, introduce the panel. Um, so uh, you see now uh, Dana Levenberg, who is uh, supervised the town of Austin and uh, my, one of my co-founders of Austin for Refugees, along with Sophia Bator. Um, so welcome, Dana. Um, Kathy O'Callaghan, who is the founder of Hearts and Homes for Refugees, uh, which has been resettling refugees under the community sponsorship model since 2016. Uh, Kathy also taught Dane and I how to do this and a bunch of other organizations in Westchester, so we thank her for that. Uh, Corolla Bracco, who is the uh, founder and head of Neighbors Link, um, which um, is a wonderful organization that works to strengthen communities through the integration of uh, immigrants into our community. And uh, Elizabeth Mastropolo, who is a managing attorney of Neighbors Link Community Law Practice. Uh, so thank you for being with us. And also Kudsia Hasek, who is a member of Austining for Refugees, I'm very proud to say, and has become a good friend. Um, and also acts as a, a translator uh, for um, recent refugees uh, throughout Westchester. And she's been wonderful in connecting some of the refugees we work with with other Afghans in the Westchester community. Um, and I know she has an awful lot of people who appreciate her work and frankly, just love her. So good see you, nice to have you on. Okay. Thank you. So I'm gonna lead off by actually uh, turning to sort of our special guest, Kathy O'Callaghan. Um, and Kathy, you know, this movie was kind of about community sponsorship. So can you help the rest of us understand this community sponsorship model that we're all using in Westchester in light of what we've seen in this film. So it is communities coming together. It's people of goodwill who, as you've mentioned, and as you've seen in this film, have um, a passion and the heart for welcoming. And they bring their expertise and their heart and their talents and their resources to help resettle refugees. They pick them up at the airport, they find housing, they scaffold, build scaffolding around them. And we, um, in 2016, our mission was not just to resettle a refugee family, which we did, the first refugee family to Westchester County, but to inspire, educate, and equip others to do the same. So it wasn't just a one-off, so that it would change the landscape. And it has caught on. There's so many of you who are part of it. Um, we've stitched together many of the groups that are here tonight and others. So we know that if given the opportunity, people will stand up. And it has been amazing since um, September. I wonder if anyone here knows how many refugees do you think we have resettled throughout Westchester? Any guesses since August? It's a fall of Afghanistan. So you might- you, Kathy. Okay. Um, we, we count almost 100 refugees since August. And that's pretty mm -hmm. phenomenal because in 2016, when we brought the first family here, they were the first family of six and then the doors closed and there were less than a hundred in the following years. So we have doubled what the number since 2016 in six months. Hearts and Homes for Refugees has um, resettled 32 of those refugees. And by the end of the month, we will be up to practically 60 refugees and 13 different community sponsor groups under our umbrella. And then you have Asining for Refugees and you have all of the groups that are represented here and that aren't on. So um, if we keep this movement up, we won't be Nebraska, but we will be 100% over where we were 
in 2016. So um, community sponsorship, it'll shift the paradigm of refugee program in this country and it's doing it. Great. So Dane, I want to turn to you. Uh, Lacey in the film said that it's important to hear the story of one person. So you, can you take what Kathy was just talking about and, and turn it uh, over maybe a series of, of single people, but that the actual one-to-one -one things, the one-to-one -one relationships that you see are important in the work we do? Absolutely. Well, I'm going to surprise you, Ted, but Katia um, is going to be one of the people speaking. And one of the first things that we're required to do by the um, the settlement agency, which in this case was highest, was to was to make a, a, a meal from the home country of the person. And the first day that we settled, um, that we brought um, F, who's our the first refugee that Asking for Refugees worked on, Kutsia made a feast during COVID for, it was supposed to be 10, but I think it was like a hundred people. And, <laughs> and she packaged everything up in these little containers so that we could all come together on Zoom and be together. And it was, it was just such a wonderful, warm feeling that she created. And that's really what, you know, what all of our volunteers at Austin for Refugees have been doing. It's just creating this warm and wonderful atmosphere for the one person, for all of the people that are coming together to support the refugees. And we, we just had a new family come um, very recently to, to get settled here. And one of our nurses, Kay, um, we found out that one of the, the very little baby had gotten a burn. Um, I think the day that they had, were arriving and a very serious burn and Kay reached out to the open door and they got, she got an appointment for her to be seen the next day, the little baby to be seen the next day and just get the care that she needed. So having, as Kathy mentioned, the professionals and the passion, um, as well as the volunteers and the heart, that's really what this is all about. And community settlement is really making people feel like they have a home called Ossining, a home called Peekskill, a home called wherever they happen to be, that is their new home and we're there for them. And we have in Ossining so many incredible support organizations like Neighbors Link. And it's really just a testament to um, our community, but also, you know, we have lots of partners in other communities like Croton, like Pleasantville, like Briarcliff, who have been working on, um, you know, sort of getting ready for this moment in time. They've been getting ready since 2017. And we all know from having watched the film and from having our lives, what happened in 2017 with our past president. So, you know, we're just so grateful for all of the people who step up and it takes a village and um, teamwork makes the dream work. I know I'm speaking in cliches, but it, they're true. Great, thank you very much, Dana. Carol, I wanna to turn to you and um, can you just, uh, Take the concept of, of welcoming communities. It's at the heart of community sponsorship. And what does it mean to be a welcoming community? And what can those of us on this call do to create welcoming communities? Thanks, Ted. Sure. I think one of the things that I'm struck by the most in all this conversation is that one of the first steps to being a welcoming community is actually having policies that allow people to come into this country and be here and feel safe here. And that's one of the things that happens for these families that we're talking about. Um, they're able to come into this country. They are um, able to receive services. They're able to work. And certainly it's one of the biggest challenges we face in this country is we think of other immigrants who are not able to um, to have any of those benefits. So in this country, the fact that we have 11 million undocumented immigrants that have been really excluded in almost every way. So one of the, the keys, the first steps to being a welcoming community is actually having policies in place that um, keep people from feeling like a second class citizen. And then the second, I think this, the second piece, and, and so what can people do as it relates to that is some significant advocacy work that creates a pathway to citizenship for those that, um, that, that are undocumented and also uh, policies that allow people to access healthcare and financial aid if you're going to college and things like that. So the advocacy work to, get the policies we need in place so that everyone can feel welcome 
is really important. And the second piece, of course, is this um, concept of everyone in the community being willing to integrate. And so sharing of culture, um, making sure that we all respect and value each other's culture. And that's really something that came through in this film in such a beautiful and moving way. And so I think that second piece to actually having a welcoming community is people willing to integrate with each other and learn from each other and create something very special when they come together. That's been one of the really wonderful things for me in getting to know uh, Kutsia and many of the people she's introduced us to as well. So I uh, very much appreciate that, uh, uh, Corolla. I do want to uh, invite uh, uh, Helen and the team to put up the donations link into the chat area. This is free for everyone who wants to watch, um, but the process that Kathy and Dana were talking about and Corolla is encouraging us to do uh, does cost money. Um, and uh, I think though, in many ways, I would say, Dana, the biggest limitation, and Kathy, the biggest limitation on what we can do is the funds we have. There's volunteers who want to help, but it costs money to pay for rent and pay for mattresses because you have to get new mattresses and uh, classes and things of that sort. So it's uh, welcome donations by uh, anybody to all of these illustrious groups. Uh, Liz, uh, maybe you could just, uh, you know, when refugees come here, there's a, a fairly cumbersome and frankly worrisome legal process. Can you just help people understand that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the refugee process is dictated by USRAP, which is the US Refugee Admission Program, which is a multi-agency program that individuals go through uh, in a third country. Uh, and so generally the way that process works is that an individual will apply with UNCHR where they complete an initial screening by, they collect biographical data. Um, and then if an applicant meets eligibility criteria, they're referred to a resettlement support center. What's important to understand is that only what, less than one in a hundred individuals will receive that referral to an RSC. Then once they get to an RSC, they have additional interviews, they have data verification, they undergo multiple criminal background checks ranging from biometric appointments to global uh, fingerprinting database reviews and medical tests. Then they're reviewed, then they are interviewed again by the Department of Homeland Security through, U through USCIS. Um, and less than 50% of those individuals will then be approved for resettlement. That process generally takes between 18 months to two years. Um, and that's when individuals will begin the uh, process of uh, having cultural orientations and going through travel to come to the United States to then be resettled and welcomed by these wonderful agencies that we have here tonight. And what's really interesting is this is only the process for refugees, which is interesting because we've been talking a lot tonight about um, individuals coming from Afghanistan. Many of the people that have been processed are now in the United States do not meet the criteria to be classified as a refugee under US uh, immigration law. Those individuals were paroled into the United States. And so they still have to go undergo all of those screenings now through an asylum process which is particularly interesting because we have 1.4 million individuals already in the backlog for seeking asylum in the United States. So we're adding additional individuals. And so to speak to Corolla's point about the need for advocacy, one of the pieces of legislations that have been proposed is the Afghan Adjustment Act. And this is the kind of, infer this is the kind of act that we need to create so that there's a pathway to citizenship for those who have been resettled from Afghanistan so that they can have work authorization and they can begin their life here in the United States. Thank you very much, Liz, that's very helpful. Um, could see ya. Um, I want to talk for a second about something I know you care a great deal about and was alluded to uh, by, I think, George when we were talking with him. Um, and that is the, the people left behind and the worries people have about that. And I, and I know you talk to so many people who are in so much pain about that. Could you just maybe speak for them for a moment? Well, I met so many Afghans who recently arrived and 
they like for instance like Frishta and like other people they left their loved one behind and obviously you know they worry about them um their life is in danger and they are in great danger actually you know, back home in Afghanistan and my family too like you know I have loved one there you know their life is great danger so um um they are here in safe place but you know um they constantly worry about their loved ones and they're not comfortable um uh, being here um uh, because the loved one you know left behind so um that's the greatest you know worry they have you know no, so I, i'm glad you spoke to that and and i know you also have very good friends that you would like to see rescued and, and worry greatly about um at the same time, um, you've talked to me about um, the people from Afghanistan and, and what we should all really know about them. Um, so we have a, a, a clear picture of who they you know, are and how strong they are. Sure, they are good, great, um, hardworking people. You know, um, they had life back home. They had houses, cars. They relative, they left everything behind uh, because of the political reason or the war, as you know, what happened to Afghanistan is just heartbreaking. Um, they left everything behind and they came and they want to come here. Um, actually, some of them are here wow. and the rest want to get here because uh, U.S. is a land of freedom and they want to be safe. They want to be rescued. And I, I want... Um, you guys are doing a great job, but I want I want you guys to you know treat them fairly and uh, with respect because um, they are very fragile. Um, um, you know they are they're not in the state of you know um, their their mind is all over, and they want to be rescued. They want to be treated well. They want to be treated fairly, and um, you know um, they want to feel safe. And um, you guys are doing a great job doing that, you know, especially you, Tad, your team are doing great. Um, everybody's so happy with the team. And also Hearts and Home are doing great. I work with Amy, uh, you know, they've been doing a great job uh, for these all these people. And um, um, on behalf of the Afghan refugees, I, I want to thank everybody, you know, for being there and for um, doing all these hard work, volunteering, you know, and, you know, um, their time is precious, but they are doing all these work, you know, may God bless them. And I want to thank them from the bottom of my heart too. I, uh, I'm so happy, you know, you people are being so great. And that's why everybody wants to come here because America is a land of freedom, land of opportunity. And, you know, uh, everybody wants to be here. So uh, I'm so great, grateful, you know, for all of you guys. And thank you. Well, and I'm sure I speak for Dan and all our group. We're grateful to have you as part of our group, Kutsia. And I know there are so many people who are grateful for your work with them, so many refugees in particular. Yeah. Um, so, um, Kathy, um, I was introduced to your group actually originally through a chain that began with Neighbors Link. I spoke to Laura Newman, who referred me to um, Holly Fink, who referred me to Steve Greeter, who referred me to you. And I met you down at a picnic back in September. I didn't know anything about refugees before then. And then here we are. Okay. So um, one of the questions that came in the chat, I invite people to ask other questions. So really getting up to that time when I'm going to stop asking questions and just ask your questions. It makes it easier for me. So help me out. Um, but uh, Kathy, one of the questions was, you know, how did they in Nebraska afford to resettle all these refugees? Now, I'm not going to ask you to ask, answer for Nebraska, but can you tell about what it, what is required financially to do the things we need to do um, for refugees when we resettle them here? So many refugees, well, the refugees and the Afghans um, have different sources of funding. So that's important to know, but every arrival, Afghan, uh, Afghans get monies through the Afghan Protection APA funding. Refugees get um, resettlement and placement money. So they come with some money that is designed to give them a head start in a month or two worth of rent. Typically the resettlement agencies would find them housing, get them their culturally appropriate meal, make sure the place was safe and get them, you know, some assistance in employment. That lasts for 90 days. 
the refugee welcoming that community sponsors can do will bring more resources, networks that these people don't have, um, and funding to the case. We were talking about this today. Um, one of the resettlement agencies, highest, used to say, well, you have to have $30,000 in the bank to resettle refugees if, if you want to be you know, part of our co-sponsor community. Um, it's not exactly the same now. And there's reasons for that. The most important thing to find is affordable housing. The next thing we do is we focus on day three, employment and language support. And the sooner we can get our refugees employed and we've created this employment network across the county, the sooner they're going to be on a path to independence. So it's not going to cost $30,000. So we really focus on that aspect of resettlement. And then we build wraparound services in all other aspects. So the funding is important. Hearts and Homes for Refugees is in a position after six years to be able to say to the people who join under our umbrella, bring your power, bring your muscle, bring your commitment, and bring what you can in good faith in funding. And we will find the rest. We have not turned down a case because of finances. What's going to be challenging is building more community sponsors. So volunteers are critical. And all that you're doing, Ted and Dana and everyone on this is so important because if we seed for more sponsors and more volunteers and we get the word out, we can inspire more of this work and the money will follow. Um, money is coming into the program. The resettlement agencies will tell you that more than ever before. So we had four years of darkness and now we have light and we just need a lot more um, committed volunteers. Well, thank you, Kathy. I'm just gonna uh, put a little shout out also to um, the Congregational Sons of Israel here in Briarcliff near where I live. Uh, who is also a supporting organization of our group, and I guess we're a supporting organization of theirs, uh, but also with your leadership and help, uh, they have one congregation has uh, taken on the task of resettling a refugee family. And I think their family comes in March 1st, so hats off to them. They're very organized, but have benefited greatly from your help. Um, uh, Dana, great to have this happening in our community, obviously. Um, I want to take some of the things Kathy talked about and again, ask you to put it on the personal level, uh, both the ESL program and then the ways that we've been able to reach out to uh, the community through the uh, supporting organizations and bulletins uh, to find jobs and to find uh, items that people need. Could you just talk about those two things? Sure. Um... Hold on, I just have some background noise just immediately happening and I'm in my home. Give me one half. Okay, all right, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. Sorry about that. Um, so yes, I just um, we have an incredible group of tutors who've been ha ha helping with ESL and we actually got um, some English language uh, um, from WCC, some English language classes to help our first refugee um, while she was still in the camp. They also got the syllabi, syllabi, syllabi from the professors, and the professors were so um, helpful working together to get those to our tutors, who then were able to work with that same syllabi, uh, with the, the same syllabus with our um, refugee to help um, continue the language um, le lessons outside of the, the virtual classroom. Um, they've also been, um, we've been, it's just been incredible. Um, we have, I think, 30 volunteers, 23 um, co-sponsoring organizations. Um, many of them are um, houses of worship who have shared out in their bulletins, um, you know, a call for help for whether a clothing, furniture, and a lot of these things, you know, we don't necessarily want to collect as we learned from Kathy and Hearts and Homes, but we want to know that they're there when we need them. And people have really stepped up in such a big way and all of these organizations, um, really just reaching out a helping hand. And again, Neighbors Link, Open Door, um, the uh, food pantry, everybody just said, you know, whatever it is that you're going to need, IFCA, we're going to be able to be there for you when you need us. And uh, it took actually a little while when we needed them was, I think, Kathy, I still remember you asking um, on one of your training calls, so, you know, who thinks they're ready to accept a, a family or an individual? I was like, we're ready. 
And then we shortly, 10, I learned thereafter that we were not even close to ready. I think you said <laughs> maybe we're 30% ready. I was like 99%. <laughs> and I felt like we were ready just because we had so many people who were so um, willing to step up and, and really just like right there day one. And we set up a slack and everybody was like on, you know, trying to figure that all out. And how could they, you know, do whatever it was that they were asked to do. And there was actually nothing to do for a couple of months because we were, but we were getting ready. And really when, when we finally had um, our, our, our friend F come to, to Austinane, we, we really were ready, but there's always more work to be more ready. And we're certainly ready. Now we have an, another family that we've been working with and we know that there's more um, following closely in their footsteps. Um, I'm hoping that I, I got all that's the, good. That's good. That's good. Anything I missed, Ted? No, that's, you know better. That, that's great, Dana. Rides, all uh, of those wonderful things. Okay. Yeah, that's great. So, um, you know, Carola, um, we at Austin for Refugees are actually uh, also beginning to look at refugees from other areas in Afghanistan. Um, they've made pretty good progress, or made us good but rapid progress moving people out of the camps. Um, and, um, but I guess I wondered if you would. Um, uh, expand this discussion beyond uh, just Afghan refugees, perhaps refugees to the broader immigrant communities and the value that immigrants bring to our country. Oh, sure. Uh, I guess to put it in context a little bit, I'll, I'll start by mentioning that in Westchester County, we're about 24% immigrants. So we've got a population of about a million people in Westchester. So about 240,000 immigrants. So that's a pretty significant number. Um, I'll also mention that a large portion, about 50% of the immigrants in Westchester uh, come from Latin America and about another 50% come from Europe and Asia. So it's a real, um, certainly a significant, di significantly diverse group. You know, when, I, when you talk about the contributions that immigrants bring to our country and to our area, I, I, I have to, start by talking about what we saw during the pandemic and the very essential workforce that really came to light during the pandemic. It was primarily immigrants that kept our grocery stores going, that kept our restaurants going. It was immigrants that were called in to clean office buildings whenever there was a positive, someone had tested positive for COVID back in the beginning when we thought what we had to do was clean offices. And so, and it was immigrants who were called in always to do that cleaning and things like that. So really a, a very essential workforce. And um, also want to add that immigrants are also entrepreneurs at a much higher rate than people that were born in this country. So certainly that's a significant value of starting up businesses, which really end up revitalizing our main streets in our towns and things like that. We've certainly seen that to be the case in, in Ossining and in other communities in Westchester. Um, so th those are some of the key areas that I can think of that um, where immigrants bring a lot of value and certainly, uh, and, and then the incredible impact that has on our, on our economy. But I do also just want to mention what I mentioned before, which is, that whole, um, this whole idea of integration because immigrants bring a very rich culture. They bring uh, a lot of creativity, ingenuity. Uh, it takes a tremendous amount of courage to be an immigrant. And so as we work to integrate immigrants into our community, we can learn from all of that. And so there is a real beautiful sharing of culture that I think is another significant value that immigrants bring to our community. Great. Right, right, right. um, so Liz, one of the questions we've had, and I'm going to actually mail two questions uh, that we've had. Um, what are the policies needed to change, we need to change for more refugees to be accepted? And then more specifically, what can we do to speed the flow of approved Afghans to Westchester? Um, well, that's a big question, right? Um, so I would say a couple of things. I think the number one issue that we've seen in immigration kind of across the board, um, whether it be the refugee in that refugee arena or with um, just USCIS and affirmative immigration applications or asylum cases is these huge backlogs of individuals who are waiting for adjudic adjudication of their applications. And what I think we need is an overhaul of our immigration systems and an addition 
of huge number of staff for immigration so that we can get through these backlogs. Individuals can have their interviews, have their cases adjudicated and um, be processed in a timely manner so that they can get to the United States. With regards to specifically um, Afghans and what we're seeing is there needs to be an increase in um, in the adjudications of SIV applications for those special immigrants who have served in our armed forces. Um, you know, those individuals provided extreme service to our country. And I think for them and their families, they should be receiving um, exigent uh, determinations of their cases. Um, and then also we need to have a more streamlined path. At this point with refugees, individuals need to be able to get out of Afghanistan in order to seek refugee status currently. That's very difficult. Um, and so I think that we need to continue to utilize humanitarian parole as much as possible to have Afghans uh, be, be able to leave Afghanistan. Um, and that's not currently happening. Currently, many of the humanitarian parole applications for those in Afghanistan are being denied and they're being asked to um, apply through UNCHR after they leave the country. Um, so I think there needs to be some kind of policy work done to see you know, how we can help those still in Afghanistan. So Liz, maybe you could just talk a little bit more about this. I'm going to I'm going to cut maybe in a little Katsia's time because I know it's an issue that she really cares about. And it seems like it's almost a catch-22 because you can't get status to to come here until you get out of Afghanistan, but you can't get out of Afghanistan. Yeah. So how do you square that circle? I mean, um, I can't square that circle. To be honest, uh, I think that there has to be some policy work done by the governments, by our government, uh, this administration, to help those individuals that are still in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. The embassies are closed there. Um, and really those people that have applied, you know, we did here at Neighbors Link, we have approximately 30 applications for humanitarian parole pending for those in Afghanistan. Um, and what we're seeing by and large is that little by little, those cases are being denied and they're being told that they need to get out of Afghanistan in order to submit an application with UNCHR. And we're in the process of trying to help people to leave the country, but it's not safe. Um, and that's not something that, you know, that we can ask our clients, you know, to do is to put themselves at further risk of, in, of, at the Taliban um, to, by trying to leave. And so I think there has to be some kind of policy work on a greater scale to help those individuals who are still in Afghanistan that we left behind. Thank you very much, Liz. So I could see, uh, um, I think in the films, the film, and I, I, we've seen it with the people we've met here, just incredible resilience of people whose lives have been just utterly destroyed. They, they, it's not just you come here and it's a new, you know, different food and different culture and things of that sort. I and mean, this is not like a travel log. I went to Italy and, you know, things change. It's like I've lost the foundations of my life. The things I expect when I get up in the morning, you know, the sun rises, I go to work. And, you know, I do these things with my children. And all of a sudden that's just completely gone. And, and, so the trauma that people have faced is obviously overwhelming. You've talked about people left behind. So I people feel guilty that they're doing here and they're safe, but they've left people behind them. Um, and, and yet these people are so strong. So I'd just like you to talk for a second about your feeling about the word refugee. They, I think they are human beings, you know, <laughs> refugees, uh, it's just a name. Uh, they are human beings. Uh, they had a life, a great life back home. Um, they had everything. All, all of a sudden, you know, um, everything was changed. Um, they were running for their lives, um, you know. Uh, as you know, uh, most people um, lost their lives uh, at the airport. I, I know most of my friends and family were there at that day. Um, um, I know these people, they just came and they told me about, oh, Basir's family. 
on that day that they, the, they at the airport uh, when the suicide bomber blew up, they were there. You know, um, they were running for their lives. So um, they're not just refugees; they are human beings. They they want to be safe, and, they, and their life want to be safe. So um, they have some difficult time adjusting, you know, um, right now. But um, just they are here to 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 live. That's all. That's all I know. Because nobody wants to leave their country. No, nobody wants to leave their loved one behind. They just want to say protect their kids and protect themselves. And um, uh, it takes time for them to get adjusted in the U.S. And I know most people have so difficult time to get adjusted. And that's why I'm going, you know, here and there, you know, make, make sure they're okay and they are feeling okay. I'm talking to them, you know, <laughs> I'm doing everything I could to make them feel comfortable, uh, to make sure, you know, to tell them, you know, it's okay everything will be fine. These people, um, but they are very grateful to you guys. They are very happy. Um, so, it's, yeah, I'd just like to also raise something that I've personally seen and, and maybe this is, you know, my waking up to an issue more that's more broad, but uh, the complexity of government forms for this area. I mean, um, I got a, a, one of our refugees received a 20 page package with no organization of forms that she was supposed to send back to Westchester DSS. There wasn't a cover letter to explain, do these four things. It took me a couple of hours to figure out what she was supposed to do. And I speak the language it was written in. And, you know, she's trying to use Google Translate to figure it out. Um, so it's just, you know, I, I've, it, it does seem as though we could do something different in the whole of, of processing these things. Um, I hope so, I hope so. That would be some changes, you know. <laughs> you, you probably spend hours doing helping people with that. Um, I so, do. so let me turn to Kathy for a second. One of the questions is, um, people, if people want to call their elected officials about these issues, um, are there specific policies they should ask about? Are and I'll let Liz answer that as well. well. The question was directed to you, but so I'll let Liz answer it as well. Well, I, mean, I can speak to the policies for refugees, okay, or Afghan cases. Um, Liz and Neighbors Link knows about all of the other more complicated um, legal um, situation. But for refugees, right now, the most important policy is passage of the Afghan Protection Act. And without that, these parolees, they have two years technically. Right now, they do not have a path to citizenship. They are, this is just temporary. Um, and we certainly can't send all 76,000 back to Afghanistan, but something has to happen. And the attention is focused on them now, but it is critical that you reach out to all of your representatives in Washington and follow this. And we've had on our um, Facebook group, we have been promoting ways to do that. Um, it's not too late. Don't let anyone tell you it's too, it is not too late until that act passes. That's what we need for Afghans. Liz, you speak to the immigrant um, policies and needs for immigration reform. Liz, before I want to answer, before you answer, I just want to let anyone know if they've raised their hand or whatever, um, please post your question to chat and we will attempt to have it answered. But Liz, please proceed. Yeah, no, I would echo Kathy's sentiments. I think for refugees, um, the Afghan Adjustment Act is going to be critically important. Otherwise, you're going to be leaving them to languish in a backlog of 1.4 million asylum cases that are already pending um, and where there aren't enough legal service providers at this point to represent all of those individuals already. Um, so I would make a second plug. I think that there's always a need for immigration legal services um, and that we should be advocating for immigration legal services with our state government. Um, there's currently negotiations over the budget for this um, with the governor. Um, and so I would absolutely put a plug in for that. I think it's critically important both for refugees and for um, immigrants within the United States. Um, and then, of course, um, I would recommend that individuals continue to advocate for a pathway to citizenship for those in our country that are integral members of this community, have been essential workers, and are left without any 
um, any pathway for themselves, um, including the DACA kids. That continues to be a pressing issue that we were told we were going to see movement on and we have not. Those with temporary protected status and of course the essential workers. So I think all of, you know, all of those individuals deserve and need a pathway to citizenship so that they can continue to live, survive, and support themselves and their families in here in the United States. Great. And uh, Katsuya, there was a statement in one of the in the film at the end. Um, well, there were two statements, but I'm going to be, refer to one first. Um, it is hard to remember. This is from my one of the refugees. It is hard to remember everything to say who we are, how we never give up, and no matter what happens, we are strong and we keep going. Can you just talk to that for a second? Um, it's been 45 years of war. Are, we, are you muted? Getting... I'm not hearing Katsia. Can you hear me now? Yes. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Can you hear me, Taz? Yes. Okay, yeah, it's been 45 years of war in Afghanistan. And um, as I grew up, all I know is war. You know, I grew up in war. And these people are so strong, um, you know. Um, for instance, there's bombing going, go, going on in Afghanistan and the next street, the people are having fun, you know. That's how strong they are. So um, they have no choice but to live their lives. You know, what can he do? Like he can't do anything except go on with your life. You know, um, nobody likes war, but um, the war is, uh, you know, it was forced upon us. So we have no, no choice but to live and be uh, more stronger and, you know, hope for the best. Great. Well, thank you, Could see you. I wanna thank all of the panel for um, both being on the panel and the insights you shared and all the great work that uh, all of you do. Uh, at the other thing at the end of the film uh, was uh, one of the speakers talked about standing up for refugees. I appreciate that all of you, and I think uh, how many, there's a couple of hundred people who signed up to be on this. It's just a wonderful and uh, touches my heart to see the support that this effort has generated. And I'm going to turn it over to uh, Helen for uh, final comments and, uh, and an invitation to any of you who wanted to support uh, these wonderful groups uh, to please be generous. Helen. Thank you, uh, everybody. I, I'm just blown away by the compassion you all have. And um, I want to thank you all for spending your evening sharing that with our community. Um, we are just you know, it's it's so hard to know what's going on, even even sometimes next door. And I think that um, events like this, where you all get to to talk about what you're doing, really helps people understand. And one thing I hope we'll do after this is we'll everybody who signed up will get an email with not just the web pages, but a few things, some of these statistics you shared, and how they should um, petition the government, and how policy is so important. Um, and um, things like sharing culture, you know, food is one of the biggest uh, ways to to share your love and appreciation for people. And Andrea, who will know this completely, that's her her thing. Andrea is the biggest share of food I know, so I, I, it really brings it home. And um, so. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you, everybody in the audience. Um, and if you have any questions, um, you can always uh, email uh, us through the websites I'm about to put up. And um, we don't have another film lined up at this time, but be assured there'll be one um, in the next couple of months. Um, so thank you, everybody. And um, if the panelists would like to stay on, I'm gonna put the share screen up, but if you'd like to stay and chat at all, that, that's fine. And I think we'll stop the recording um in a moment thank you thank you helen and thank you everyone thank you so much thank you great job really nice good to see everyone I'm your second case your second case will be so much easier dana 